I'm the Secretary of the Army, Dr. Joseph. Hi. Hi. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you're doing here today? Well, um, a couple of things. One is um, in, invited by uh, General Caslin to come in with uh, uh, General Durbin, Lieutenant General Durbin, who is the director of our business transformation um, uh, efforts and our uh, management efforts in the, in the Department of the Army, to come in and talk to the students um, both about uh, the shaping of uh, future decisions about how we develop and manage the force and to talk about uh, uh, the turbulence that we're experiencing these days with respect to budgets and and uh, and uh, future development of the Army. So it's an opportunity to engage with students and, and have a dialogue about uh, their role, their future role in the Army in shaping that future. Uh, so we've had some very, very wonderful opportunities to have good conversation and good back and forth. Um, speaking of, uh, I have a couple questions along this line. Speaking of uh, the, the turbulence, I mean, uh, we understand that um, you know a, a few hundred contractors working on um, on these in Pennsylvania and Texas were were let go, and and I I wonder, you know, to what degree is the budget impacts jeopardizing? you know, multi-year contracts, installation, construction projects. Um, are we going to, you know, could we potentially be seeing more of this? We could. Uh, we, you know, we, we are under this continuing resolution, which doesn't allow us to reprogram funds, and we're operating essentially at funding levels of 010. Uh, if you look at both uh, some of these contracts as well as our, our MILCON, our you know, military construction, a lot of the MILCON is uh, new starts, uh, which obviously we cannot begin to do that work until there's a, a bill passed. So the congressional uh, efforts to get a resolution on the budget are really very, very important to keep some of that from happening and to allow us to start projects that we were supposed to start this year as well as continue to fund contracts that we have. Uh, what, what are some of the, the potential impacts I mean, of, of the um you know, Humvee restoration was one thing. Where else could we see? Um, uh, I don't have specifics in terms of some of our procurement areas. I just know that that we are looking at all those contracts and we're um, we're keeping track of where we may have issues and we're trying to tell Congress where those issues would lie, because we we hope we might get some authority to do some reprogram if we need to if it's a dire situation. Uh, and I think Congress is willing to work with us. It's just that they've got to get through their um, uh, their debate on on earmarks and all the other issues associated with passing a budget. Um, I've got another another one um, along the lines of uh, Army transformation. We this is I just heard about this this morning. We heard that um, that there might be plans to reshape the uh, the reserve. And create a some kind of um, hybrid service member who would, um, you know, serve uh, more than a traditional reservist, but maybe not as much as an active du duty troops. Um, is this something that, um, you know, could this is this, is this a plan that could potentially affect the army operationally, budget-wise, force structure? I mean, is is it too soon for me to ask? You know. Uh, what, what kind of implementation we might see on something? Yeah, it, it's too soon to, to, to know what direction we would go in. Uh, we had a, a study that was just uh, uh, developed and, and, and produced by General, former Chief of Staff of the Army, uh, uh, General Reimer, that, um, and others who look at uh, how we might operationalize the Guard and Reserve in the future and give us some options uh, that we might have to employ depending upon the, both the resourcing and the ability to implement the r 4 gen model. So we're only at the very beginning stages of looking at that and trying to determine, and with the new chief of staff coming on board, General Dempsey, I'm sure he'll take also a much harder look at uh, how he thinks we ought to be able to address that question. The things that you mentioned certainly have been out there as possibilities, but they're only just ideas uh, that we're trying to explore. 
as to how we can keep the, the Guard and Reserve operational. In order for us to really be able to deploy forces the way we're doing it uh, under the current demand, we need the Guard and Reserve, and we need them to be operational. And we don't want to go back to a situation where um, we, we just simply don't have the trained forces that we have now. So it's something we're, we're taking a very great care. We've had numerous discussions about this over the last year um, internally in the Army about addressing this issue, about ensuring that we got funding for it. So we're very, very, very focused on it. It's unlikely that we'll see a return to a, uh, to a tiered model uh, like we had before. Yeah, I mean, if, you know, I can't say that it's completely impossible that we'll get there. Uh, there's no desire to be there on the part of anybody, secretariat or, or army staff. There's no, uh, there's no basis for which to go back to that, uh, other than we are decimated with respect to, to uh, our ability to resource our forces and to deploy them the way we need to. But the, the, you know, we've gone through a wholesale transformation of our army into a modular force, and it's, it's worked. Uh, it's had its issues, but we think if we can get to a more balanced force here with, uh, you know, a, a, a deployment uh, and bog dwell ratio that makes sense for our soldiers, we can continue to do the modulars. In, and uh, in the last uh, couple of days, um, you visited Detroit, and I was wondering, kind of, are, are there some, you know, some, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what you, um, which you and the general have been up to, and sure. and whether there have been any lessons out there yeah. um, for the army. Well, that uh, the meetings in Detroit is uh, the uh, we're trying to establish. We have a, 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 a memorandum of agreement with the Department of Energy that was signed by the two deputy secretaries uh, more than a year ago, and one aspect of that agreement to to work and collaborate together uh, that we're trying to uh, develop now is on um, energy efficiency in our vehicles and our um, both our tactical vehicles and our fleets in general. How do we get greater energy efficiency? And also look at everything from robotics to batteries and so on and so forth. And to do this uh, essentially with the Department of Energy to do bring a lot of the research and technology development that they have available to tie it to our operational energy piece. So this meeting in Detroit was to convene uh, DOE, DOD, um, <clears throat> along with uh, uh, some folks from industry mm -hmm. and academia to look at how do we implement a, um, a, a partnership of sorts to really put uh, attention, focus, and, and resources to do this. And, uh, and, and Senator Levin, who's the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, has been very, very instrumental in, in getting more both resources to the Army and to DO, DOE to help uh, uh, move this along. What could that uh, look like in the future? Uh, electric powered uh, GCBs or, uh, or, or um, right. you know, wind power at installations like right. uh, Leavenworth? Uh, it, 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 it focuses, first of all, we're, we're trying to focus on the, on the vehicles mm -hmm. principally. So in that case, it's, it's not only uh, how do we look at uh, reducing the, the dependency on, on, on carbon uh, uh, resources, uh, but uh, how do we get uh, you know, greater environmental sustainability in our, in our fleets in general? So uh, biofuels, uh, uh, how, to, how, to, how to build uh, cars and, and trucks and vehicles that will uh, uh, employ various alternative energy sources for, uh, uh, for, their, uh, for their energy. And then, um, and then we're moving that into, you know, we're moving that also into how do we address the grids, how we address uh, things like solar and, 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 and wind energy and so on. So I think we have such great opportunities to do great work with, with DOE on this. I'm, I'm very excited about it. The Navy's doing great work in this area as well, and we're attempting to um, keep a, a close uh, relationship with them and also watch what they're doing and their measure of success in some of these areas as well. So, uh, but we're just starting. I mean, we're just starting to move more aggressively in this area. Right. It, it sounds like in the, I mean, I've, uh, over the last few years, we've seen 
you know, independent initiatives pop up at different installations, you know, whether it be like solar panels on a building in Germany or, you right. know, electric golf carts at an installation. There's a, the, um, the arm, uh, Army acquisition community trying to incorporate energy right. efficiency in their standards. Right. Industry is watching all this mm -hmm. and they are stepping up to the plate too. So in the last six months or more, I've gotten a lot more briefings from industry about what they're doing to, uh, to, to gain greater efficiency in, in uh, forward operating base operations and you know, connect, the, uh, connect the grids in a more effective and efficient manner. So there's, there's a lot of work being done and we want to capture that and, and maximize its potential. Are, are there any specific technologies that appear as though they'd be more likely to work for the Army, like say, uh, in, in terms of power and vehicles, or you know, is um, uh, is, uh, is electric kind of the, seem to be the most promising? Well, you know, the the whole research on batteries and ba you know reducing the size of the battery and the efficiency of batteries is is a lot of the work that's going on, and it's a challenging it's it's very challenging work, and we're we're on the cusp of you know greater greater development in that field. So that's one one big important field. Um, the the uh, uh, TARDEC in in Detroit in uh, uh, in Michigan is also doing a lot of research on engine technology and adapting uh, um, the vehicles to essentially be more efficient in their gas consumption mm -hmm. uh, and their diesel diesel gas consum consumption and they're um, they're doing a lot of work also to retrofit uh, suspensions and and uh, in, incorporate efficiencies in the vehicles that will get us more miles and will get us more efficiency in there. So it's a holistic, holistic view. The other thing we did in Detroit is that, uh, you know, the car makers, the three car makers, you know, went uh, on the brink of, of and into bankruptcy and they've come back. And so we're also looking at how, they've, how they're transforming themselves from a business operation standpoint. Uh, so that we can obtain some lessons learned from them about management practices and business transformation that we could apply as we move forward in the Army as well as an organization. Do you see some specific, parallel, you know, some specific parallels there or, or were there some takeaways? Uh, there, there were not, only because the meetings that we were supposed to have with Ford got moved uh. and got canceled because of weather. Uh, Ford was one of the ones that we really wanted to talk to because their business transformation was, so we're going to just shift those meetings to Washington uh, in the next couple of weeks. We think that there are some parallels there and, and we, we've, we've talked to IBM and we've talked to a lot of other industries, uh, I mean uh, industry enterprises that have gone through some significant business transformation and that not only parallels but really good examples of things that we ought to be thinking about how we become a more integrated uh, a better aligned management system, more more uh, cost conscious. I just have one more. I don't want to monopolize so you. Okay. <laughs> but, the, but the but um, the I mean, is that kind of um, is that kind of conversation? Um, I mean, un, unprecedented. Where did that idea come from to reach out to the automakers and you know and and is this um, is that kind of contact happened before? I I. I don't know. I don't think so. I've never heard of it, but that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Um, you know, I, I would say that that in the past, automakers weren't going through business transformation. It's why they were bankrupt. Uh, I think that they have learned some valuable lessons uh, in in everything from their logistics to their uh, financial management to various other aspects of their operations, and those are the things that we want to we want to capture. Um, so uh, I think it's also unique because the, the, the car makers are uniquely, well, Chrysler is now Fiat, mm -hmm. um, partly owned by Fiat, but uh, uh, the, these are uniquely American companies that are, you know, have always reflected the American mm -hmm. manufacturing strength and, uh, and they're coming back. And so it's an opportunity for us also to, to uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, look at how they see themselves in these world markets and in this, in this uh, uh, new phase of their business operations that could help us also adapt. It's very fitting to be here and having that conversation because, the, um, because of the initiatives here where um, the 
a profession of arms campaign that's going on out of CAC and where the Army's taking another uh, a look at itself. So. Right. Right. I, I, and I think that's going to be happening. I'm very excited about the work that's going on here and across all of our schools to, to, to look forward uh, long term and reshape uh, how we think about ourselves and how we think about the missions that this Army will be called to do in the future. We had talked a little bit before about the transformation of the civilian education system. Um, what exactly is the initiative that you're, you're working on? Well, uh, you know, interestingly enough, we're, we're sitting in a school where the, the, the soldier uh, gets a, a great deal of leadership training, and as they, as they gravitate up to uh, senior officers in the Army, there's a lot of investment in the leadership development of our officers and our generals in particular, our senior leaders. Um, I would like to do the same thing for our senior civilian workforce. And there are two things, two or three things that are um, a problem there. First is m most senior civilians in the Army, and we have almost uh, uh, close to 300,000 civilians that work in the United States Army across the world, most of them do not have a career path, a clearly defined career path, an MOS like you would have if you were a soldier. Um, and consequently, their ability to move and, be, and, and, and have the mobility within the Army and the flexibility to contribute where they can is limited by that. Uh, we want to get to a point where uh, our senior civilians have very defined, clearly defined career paths. And uh, secondly, uh, we, we, we don't invest as very much at all in their leadership education, and we should do that no differently than we do in a general officer today, because they are general officers that, on the civilian ranks. So uh, investing in their education and their talent and their leadership development, I think, will pay huge dividends for the Army in the future. And, I'm and will this come from working on the, the current uh, civilian education system or developing a new sort of um, promotion? Well, I, I think what we're going to try to do is to try to uh, first blend it with the military education. And I think in many cases the ideal setting will be one in which you have general officers and, and, and senior um, uh, civilians sitting in the same room, uh, learning from the same instructors and, and going through the same leadership development process. Not only would that be more economical, it would make more sense and a better dialogue across uh, the civilian and military. Uh, there may be areas where we focus more strictly on the civilian leadership development because there are areas where um, it's more uniquely a civilian function. But I think we would uh, strive to do it across both. And by the way, the, the biggest advocates for this are the chief of staff and the, and the vice chief of staff of the Army. So this is not a the civilians wanting to do something that the Army doesn't think is necessary. They believe strongly that the Army uh, on the uniform side is better off by a, a better educated, uh, more flexible, more agile civilian workforce, particularly at the leadership levels. So, you know, given again the, the budget pressures that we're under and the need to make decisions and prioritize these kinds of, um, these kinds of areas, as we enter into this next POM and as we do budget for the next uh, next round of uh, fiscal year budgeting, this will have to compete with a lot of other things that are out there and we'll have to see how, how it works. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push it pretty hard. I know that, um, uh, that you have some meetings set up with uh, wounded warriors. Um, you know, in terms of, um, actually hadn't thought that question through entirely, but I guess what I, I, what I want to ask is, you know, um, you know, where do they fit into this process? You know, how we take care of, you know, how we take care of our soldiers and making economic decisions, um, you know, our, uh, our force is very stressed. Um, yeah. Well, there's two, there's two ways to answer your question. I mean, the first is that as an army, and as an ar in, in our army leadership across the board, and when I say army leadership, I'm talking down to, you know, to all levels. Uh, there is a complete and total commitment to the support of our wounded warriors. Um, and the support of their families, because their families are so integral to their getting well. So there is just no, no backward step in this area. I mean, we are putting resources, we're putting focus, we're putting attention into this. Um, the Army 
one of the things I love about the Army is its commitment to these soldiers, that after they've been wounded, after they've lost limbs and they have serious injuries and they're recovering from that, they are still our soldiers and they are still, we're still with them, we still support them, and we still want them in the force as much as possible. There will be a point where certain ones either can't serve or don't want to serve anymore, but we respect that. But So it's, it's a huge commitment that we make, and it's uh, resource intensive, but that's not, that's not how we look at it. The second piece of this is uh, sort of my own personal one, which is when I have opportunities to travel and to go places, um, I like to make it available for some of those men and women who are at Walter Reed or Bethesda or some of our, our local areas there, um, give them an opportunity to get out of town, to, to, to spend some time um, in a different environment. And uh, uh, it's really an opportunity for them to, to have a little bit of fun and a little bit of uh, a different view than they've been sitting in for the last several months. So if we get doctors okay, if they are able to go, then I usually will invite uh, two or three to come on a plane. And of course, they've got to put up with my schedule, which means that they've got to go to places whether they like them or not that I'm going to. Uh, and in this case, uh, um, they came to uh, Detroit, and now they had to come to Leavenworth. And but my hope is that they just this is a little bit of R&R, &R and they, they get to uh, enjoy that. So this isn't a first for you to take, to take no, some wounded no, warriors along? No, no, no. And you know, uh, uh, they love uh, sporting events, so when they're, what I try to do also is to, is to get a situation where we, we can get a sporting event that will always be delighted to host wounded warriors. So we did that in Michigan. And, uh, where'd you go? Detroit Red Wings. Okay. And they hosted, um, they had a, a, a wonderful uh, um, situation where they recognized uh, during a, a certain time in the game. Um, and so they, they, they recognized the Wounded Warriors that were there and they um, put them on the screen and they thanked them for their service. And I just think it, it's, it's a great recognition. Uh, uh, and, and so you have a mix of, of soldiers that are coming, that are active army coming from, let's say, Walter Reed, mm -hmm. with soldiers that are Guard and Reserve, um, who are probably in, in local area hospitals. And we, you know, it doesn't make any difference if they're active army too. They can also be veterans who have been wounded and are in the community. So I think it's a great opportunity. And our, 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 our major sports uh, franchises are just terrific about doing that. You, you don't even have to, you just ask, ask them and they're, they say, come on, we'll do something. Have you had much ch chance to get acquainted with the Wounded Warrior Education Initiative that we have here and with the University of Kansas? I have not. Have I have any not. questions about that yet? I have not, but um, I'm, I'm sorry to say I don't know about that particular initiative. But my two oldest kids went to the University of Kansas. Okay. Graduated from KU. I guess there's a big game tonight. We're all excited about it. Time for one more. Okay. Were you hoping to learn something from the CGSC students today? I know there's a little bit oh, of Oh, my God, yes. You know, first of all, I traveled here with General, uh, Lieutenant General Bob Durbin. Mm -hmm. And um, General Durbin, uh, obviously, as a Lieutenant General, has been in the Army a long time, and, and he's a senior leader, and, and he has. Uh, you know, he's, he's faced every piece of the Army, from combat operations to, you know, being a, uh, a budget guy and a division commander and all that. So the opportunity to engage with him and with soldiers and to, to go back and forth uh, and to challenge them from his perspective and my perspective, I think is, uh, is pretty unique. I'm not sure anybody else does it that way. Uh, so we're becoming a, a real we're thinking about taking this on the road and, no, I'm kidding. Um, but really, I mean, if you think about it, you've got a senior army officer and a senior civilian kind of talking about how they view the world from different lenses, but yet are looking at the same issues. 
And I think it's a, I think it's a great learning experience to be with him. It's a great learning experience to hear from soldiers and, 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 and future leaders of the Army what they're thinking uh, and learning, uh, what their challenges are, and what they're not thinking, what they're not thinking about. And what, what, uh, Were there any specific takeaways from the, from the talk today? Yeah, I think the, I think the biggest takeaway would, for me personally would be uh, that, you know, these, um, these young majors here who are going to, going to continue to, to, uh, to move up the leadership ranks of the Army are going to be facing some very big challenges, and this is the time when they're not to be thinking about it. And frankly, many of them admitted that they, you know, their constraints are that they, ha they, they haven't been mentored to think that way, mm -hmm. um, but they are becoming more and more conscious that that is the future, that they need to be thinking of themselves not just as combat operators, but as part of the generating force that continually supports the ability of the Army to, uh, to conduct its missions. And so they're, um, they're becoming increasingly aware of that. It was a good takeaway to note that and to be able to, to have some good dialogue about that. Okay, sir. Sure, okay, sure. great. Thank you. Thank you.